So we started a series, new series last week, didn't we, Pastor Wells? God is the goat. You know, when you think about the goat, you know, there's a lot of talk of the goat, especially if you're in the NFL world, you know. Tom Brady is uh, appropriately, I think, appropriately named the goat, which is an acronym for the greatest of all time. Hey, Pastor David, good to see you. Good to have you guys with us today. Um, he's appropriately named the GOAT, the greatest of all time. And there's a variety of people on that screen that, you know, you could say they are the GOATs in their field. And so you all, you know, I shared with that. How many of you was, la- uh, was here last week? Uh, most of you, a few aren't, didn't. So it might bear just a, a quick, quick, quick uh, recap. So what happened was, was uh, like in late fall, October, November, something like that, I was getting uh, ready for church one Sunday morning, and uh, like the Lord usually does when he speaks to me, some reason or another begins to talk to me when I'm in the bathroom. I, I don't get it, but that's where he does it a lot of times, you know. Your thing might be different. Maybe it's in a car for you. Maybe it's uh, in a different place. But the Lord began to speak to me, and he was very clear. And it was, it was one of those times to where sometimes, you know, you just go, ah, is that just me? And then other times, you know, you go, oh, man, it's so loud. You're, you're, I know it's you. I don't really want it to be you. And so the Lord started speaking to me, and he said, uh, I want you to call your younger brother who lives in Kansas City. He said, I want you to, to call him and I want you to ask him if he had one message that he could give to the world, just one, what would it be and to put it down in sermon form? And so I hesitated. He's, that really wasn't what I would think would be his thing that necessarily he would really want to hear, which I'm sure he's watching today. Hey, Mike. Hi, Holly. And... Uh, And so I didn't really want to do it. And so I took my time, and the next day rolled around, and I finally I told Debbie about it, and and, uh, the next day rolled around, I said, I can't quite get it off my mind, and it's still on my mind. And and, uh, she said, "Uh, why don't you just do it and get it over with? Just call him and get it over with. Just be done with it. And I'm like, all right. So I called him, and I told him. I said, you know, the Lord put on my heart to tell you this, and I told him, shared all that with him, and he was very quiet. And he said, well, I'll think about it, and I'll get back with you. And uh, then on Wednesday, he calls me back, and he said, I just want you to know that you really freaked me out. Well, you know, when you said that, it was, those were his words. And he said, uh, I just, I've been thinking about that ever since you said that. And I said, oh, well, okay. And he said, what you don't know is this. He said, on Sunday morning, he had called my mom and was talking to her, and she said, hey, now this is the same Sunday the Lord spoke to me and said, I, I, I had a dream that you and you were writing sermons or preparing sermons, and you and Phil were preaching the sermons together. And then I, if I had obeyed, it would have been literally within hours that he would have essentially heard the same thing. And so it was very obvious to him and obviously to anybody that heard that that the Lord was involved. He was talking. He was, you know, trying to get, A, I believe, his attention, but also the message that he proceeded to begin to work on. And so it took some months, but he began to work on a, uh, on, a, on a message. And the message essentially was what I titled, God is the Goat. He's not only the greatest of all time, but he's also the goodest of all time. And I know that's probably not a word, but that is the reality of who God is. Yeah. There's a huge difference between great and good. God is both. But they stand for different things. And we live in a society, we live in a, in a time period to where people really want to be great. It doesn't matter what you do. They're, well, I say time period. You know, honestly, everybody wants to be great. Everybody wants to be great at something. If you're a business person, you want to be a great business person. If you're a pastor, you want to be a great pastor. If you're a football player, you want to be a great football player. If you're an evangelist, you want to be a great evangelist. If you uh, are an assistant pastor, you want to be a great assistant pastor. And if you own a pressure wash business, you want to be a great pressure wash business owner. Right? 
So you want to be great. You want to be a great cameraman. You want to be everything that you're involved in that, that just comes kind of inside of us. You want to be great at what you do. But great tends, if you're not careful, great tends to carry with it the tone of you because it is your achievement, your, you, the things that you've done. You've, 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 you've went you know, and, and made the commitment, paid the price, and you became great. But see, that tends to be about just you. Now, what we talked about last week was this. And these are all the notes that Mike sent me, and I, I added a little bit, but largely they're primarily his notes, and I studied them and, and got them inside of me and, and began to, and meant most of them, almost all of them, I was like, you know, very familiar with, but it all became revelation to me the way that I believe the Lord had shared with him. And so this is what I'm, I'm giving you over the next few weeks. And so we talked about the differences between great and good. God is a great God. There's no question about that. But notice that the things that make God great revolve around his power. They revolve around his ability. I mean, like, when you can raise the dead, it's pretty great. When you can part Red Seas, it's pretty great. I mean, the acts of God are great and mighty acts. Nobody argues that. But God doesn't do great things just so that he can be a great God. God does great things with the intention of doing something good. God raised the dead. Why? If that's a great act, did he raise the dead so he could go, did y'all see this? Did y'all see what I just did? He didn't do it so he could talk about it, brag about it, show off about it. He did it because he wanted to restore life. Yes. Amen. He parted the Red Sea, not just so that he could say, uh, watch this. He did that because the intent was to save the Israelite people from the bondage of Egypt. Amen. Every great act that God does is with an intention of something good. Uh -huh. The problem for us many times is we want to be great because we want to be great. If we can get inside of us, let's want to be great so that we can do something good. If we get that kind of reality inside of us, that the reason that we're striving and aspiring to be great is so that we can achieve something good, then it becomes, it takes on an entirely different perspective. You see it entirely different. And so we, we looked at a lot of scriptures. I want to go ahead and just kind of jump ahead because um, uh, I, I, for sake of time, I want to try to get as far as I can with this. In fact, let me just, let me just start right in Galatians 5. We, we were there just a little bit, and, and let me kind of jump from here. Galatians 5, 22, verse uh, 22 and 23 says, But the fruit of the Spirit, now when we say the fruit of something, we know what that's referencing, right? It just means the producing of something. The fruit of the Spirit means something that comes of the Spirit. Amen. So if we're in the Spirit and the Spirit of God's in us, then these are the kind of things that we should see coming out in our lives. You can actually kind of tell where people are at in life if you watch close enough. If you watch close enough and you don't see some of these things coming out of some people, then you know there's not a whole lot of the Holy Spirit in them. Right. Don't shout me down now. Don't get mad at me. Amen. He said the fruit of the Spirit is... Love, if you don't see much love coming out of people, there's a telltale. If you don't see a lot of joy coming out of people, somebody's always down and depressed, and then there's, there's a, a little bit of tell. They need a refill of the Holy Spirit, right? Amen. If they don't have any peace, if they're not long-suffering, and boy, that's a big thing for us. Nobody wants to suffer long. Nobody wants to suffer at all, right. much less long-suffering. I wish the Lord had not put that in there. But he said long-suffering. That means that in order for us to actually, if the Spirit of God's in us, you'll be willing to suffer a little bit. And that doesn't mean he's not talking about sickness and disease. Don't, don't misunderstand because people's minds tend to go there. He's talking about just not getting your way all the time. Watch out now. Gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. Now those are the fruit of the Spirit, but notice what is not in that. He does not mention one time anything about being great. The fruit of the Spirit, one of the fruits of the Spirit is not great or greatness. Because greatness, if it's not done correctly, is all about you and it becomes a selfish motive. 
you want to be great, I want to be great, I want to be known as the greatest. Well, that's the wrong intention, wrong motive. Motive matters in the kingdom of God. Jesus was, in fact, great, but his motive was always good. Everything Jesus did that was great was with the motive of doing something good. And if we can get that same kind of motive, then, then it's okay to be great. So great can be about him, but if, it, if it's not done with that intent, it becomes really just about you. So we have to realize that, a, uh, uh, that our relationship with him would not be possible. Do you know, it would not be possible to have a relationship with God if it wasn't for his goodness. Because greatness would not have brought us in a relationship. As the phrase that we put on the big screen there, greatness created the world. God's greatness created the world, but his goodness saved the world. There's a big difference, and we're going we're to get into this in just, just a little bit, so just bear with me. And so many people want their relationship with God to, to be, uh, you know, they want the relationship with God, but God's not really interested in your relationship revolving around his greatness. God's not really interested in that. He's not interested in you identifying to his greatness as much as you are identifying to his goodness. Amen. It, but because goodness is a reference of his integrity. It's a reference of his character, his desire, what his heart is. Greatness is about his ability. And see, that, there's no place to connect to as far as relational to, to greatness, but there is to, to goodness. That's why that he tells us, and, and he wants it to, to spill over to us as well. That's why he says in 1 Thessalonians 5, 21, prove all things, hold fast to that is good. And he says in Galatians 6, 9, and 10, and let us not be weary in well-doing or in good-doing. That's just another word for good-doing, well-doing, in good-doing. For in due season we shall reap if we faint not. As we have therefore opportunity, let us do Good. Notice he didn't say, let us be great unto all men. Let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are the household of faith. So two things here. He tells us this. He says, it's so important that even when you get tired, don't stop doing it. And then the second thing is, is he uses the word opportunity. That, that tells me this. There are times in our lives that we have opportunities to do something good, but an opportunity doesn't mean it's there forever. And sometimes we can miss the window of our opportunity to do something good. When God starts to speak to us about doing something good for somebody else's life, in somebody else's life, that means this, you may not have it tomorrow. When the Lord speaks to you about doing something, you do it now because you may not have that same opportunity tomorrow. And so that's why he says, look, as we, therefore, as we have therefore opportunity let us do good unto all men, especially those that are the household of faith. That's like when we have ministers that come in. Brother Kenny's going to be speaking here soon. As you have opportunities to do something, that's when you do it, when you have the opportunity, especially to those who are of the household of faith. It's wonderful to be a blessing and to help somebody when you have the opportunity to sow into their lives. Because you might not have it again. We, we were privileged a number of years ago. We, we didn't know it at the time. But we, I had, I, you know, when I was growing up, I was raised to know the, the names like Kenneth Hagen, Kenneth Copeland, Jerry Savelle, Jesse Duplantis. But there was this one guy that connected with Jerry Savelle and Kenneth Copeland. His name was uh, Dr. Bill Bozanski. Okay? And so we had heard, I'd heard about him, heard his testimony. He's from, actually, ironically, from the Ukraine. And he, gave, he wrote a book that was amazing about, uh, uh, I think the original name was Escape from Terror, about how that, you know, during the Soviet Union, he lived in the Ukraine when it was part of the Soviet Union, which now they're trying to make it, again, part of the Soviet Union. And, and he talks about what a terrible life that he lived. He said he didn't even know uh, that, like, when you could go into a grocery store and get a, a gallon of milk. He said, and I was like, wow, you could actually just go into the refrigerator case and get a gallon of milk. He said, otherwise, in his mind, they, they had to go milk the cow. I mean, sometimes we don't know how good we got it, right? Now, that's, another, that's just another sermon for another day, though. So, anyway, so we called. And we're like, well, we probably never get anybody. We're a small church just getting started. He'll probably not come. But you know what? We invited him, and he, and he came. 
We had an opportunity, one opportunity, one opportunity to sow into this man's life. He was 77, I think, at the time that he was here, I, I believe. And it was within just a short time after he had, he had been here, he'd preached at our church, and he was scheduled to preach at an event in Indiana. And he didn't make it. We were the last, watch now, we were the last church that he ever preached on the planet. We had an opportunity, one opportunity. If somebody said, you know what? He was pretty good. I'll do something the next time that he's back. You missed your opportunity. You don't know. That's why he uses these things. Do good as you have an opportunity, especially to those who are of the household of faith. Amen. Boy, that would have been great. That would have been a great offering right there, wouldn't it, Brother Kenny? I, that, would have, that would have worked well right there. So he's, one of my favorite scriptures is Romans 2, 4. He tells us, he says, Don't you know that the goodness of God is what leads men to repentance? So much fear is being preached to try to convince people to come to serve God, to try to coerce you, to try to manipulate you. I've heard people say things like, I'll do anything to get somebody saved. If it's not of their doing, it's not their salvation. You can't coerce somebody to get saved. You can encourage them. You can, you can take them, the, as old saying, you take lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. You put him in front of the watering uh, trough, but at the end of the day, it's his choice to drink. So we bring them in, we put them in the atmosphere, but until somebody gets a revelation of God's goodness, salvation is very, it's a fleeting thing. Because when you try to scare somebody into it or manipulate them into it, it doesn't take. But when they get a revelation of the goodness of God, then it becomes a real thing to them. It becomes a reality that I believe God's good. That's the reason he did what he did. And why would I not want to be saved? That's what happens. And that's the mindset that people have when they get a revelation of his goodness. Now, let me ask you this. Do you believe that Jesus was, he, do you believe he came to the world to be a great man or a good man or both? Jesus came to do both things. He came to be great with an intention of being good. He shows us that in the scripture when it says, uh, Acts chapter 10, verse 38, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and power who went about doing good and healing all those that were oppressed of the devil for God was with him. He said he, went, he was anointed to do good. We are anointed to do something good in our lives. We, we don't have Jesus' anointing in, the, in, in its fullest, but we have the anointing of him. And if we have the same anointing that, that raised Christ from the dead, if that same anointing dwells in us, then don't we have the same ability and capability to be good yes. people Amen. and do good things? Or I'll even say this, to do great things as long as it's with good intentions. That's right. Amen. There's nothing wrong with being great as long as it's with the intention to be good. God wants us to be great at being good. He tells us, 1 John 3, verse 8, He that commits sin is of the devil. The devil sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. The intent that Jesus came, he did some great things. When he, when he raised the dead, he's, that's what he's doing. He's destroying the works of the devil. But why? With a good intent. Do you remember, this is how much Jesus shunned and, and shed the thought of great. Do you remember that he, he came and, and had an encounter in John chapter 4 with the woman at the well? He told the lady, he said, you know, if you knew who you was talking to, you'd ask him for a drink, and that drink would cause you to have everlasting life. And she asked him a question. She said, uh, well, you ain't got nothing to, to you. of course, she's thinking naturally. She says, you ain't got anything to draw with and pull it out with. And uh, are you greater than our ancestor Jacob? Now notice, if you go back and look in John chapter 4, and we just don't want to take the time to, to get to there, but you can if you want to another time, you'll notice this. Jesus does not defend himself and say, Ma'am, absolutely, yes, I'm greater than Jacob. Do you believe Jesus was greater than Jacob? Yes. Of course. Does he defend himself? Because he's not interested in, in her perception of seeing him as great. He's interested in her perception of seeing him as good, as a savior. 
not as him being great. Same thing happens in uh, another account in John chapter 8. Jesus could, they said, are you greater than uh, 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 our father Abraham? Well, Jesus could have said, of course I'm greater than Abraham, but he doesn't respond. He just lets them go ahead and just do their stuff, do their talking. He's not interested in defending his greatness. He wants you to see him and know him for his goodness. But yet, in Acts chapter 8, there was a man named Simon. And he heard about Jesus, and he was a sorcerer. And, and, and so he kind of saw what was going on, and, and at some point later, he got, he got saved. But before that, the Bible says that he went around. Let me just read this one verse says that there was a certain man called Simon, which before time in the same city used sorcery, and bewitched the people of Samaria, giving out that himself was some great one. In other words, he wanted to be known as a great one. And when you want to be known as a great one for the sake of being known as a great one, you are on shaky, very questionable ground. Because now it has become all about your aspirations and not about what God wants. You want to be known as a great one. He wanted to be known as a great one, and he's not with God. And folks, when we want to be known as a great one that's separate from doing something good for the kingdom of God, then it pulls us away from, from the relationship that God has for us. In John chapter 10, in fact, let me just look there real quick. I better yet, guys, throw that up there real quick. John chapter 10, verse 10. I'll just read it from here. He says, The thief comes not but for to steal, kill, and destroy, but I've come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. So Jesus is telling us that there is a thief and there is an intention to try to hurt you. He said, But I've come that you might have life and that you might have it what? More abundantly. So in other words, he's saying, I've come to give you something that is a good thing. But watch. He says, I am the does he say great shepherd? Nope. Now he could have. He could have just as easily said, I'm the great shepherd, and the great shepherd gives his life for the sheep. But notice, great doesn't work well. It doesn't complement giving. But he said, I'm the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays his, down for, lays his life down for the sheep. He could have used these words, but he didn't, and he didn't for a reason. He's chosen these words. Every single thing that is in the Bible is here with an intent. There's a purpose behind every word that was put in the Bible. It's not just a random thought. These are not just random things. Look at Mark chapter 10. I'm just going to let them, I'm just going to read it up here. Mark chapter 10, verse 35 he says, and James and John, the sons of Debedee, Zebedee, came to him saying, Master, we would that uh, uh, you should do for us whatever we desire. And he said unto them, what would you that I should do for you? What do you want me to do for you, in other words? And they said to him, grant unto us that we may sit one on your right hand and the other on your left hand in glory. What does that sound like? I want to be known as great. I'm the great one. I'm on your right hand, and I'm on your left hand. But Jesus said to them, you don't know what you ask. Can you drink of the cup that I drink of and be baptized with the baptism that I'm baptized with? But to sit on my right hand and on my left hand is not mine to give, but it shall be given to them for whom it's prepared. And when the ten heard it, they began to be much displeased with James and John. In other words, the group heard, well, what do you mean? You're trying to outdo us. Do you, you sense? It's almost like the disciples really enjoyed the great part of Jesus. They enjoyed calming the seas. They enjoyed watching him walk on water. They enjoyed him uh, raising the dead. They enjoyed all the, the miracles and the, the great things that he did. But when it came to just, wait, let's, this is the reason that we do something great, it seemed to be just not quite as attractive. And you know what? It's because it's a shiny thing. And we tend to be the same way. We like shiny things, don't we? <clears throat> but when there's something a little more just serene, something a little more calmer, it doesn't quite grab our attention as much. But yet it's more profound. So he's trying to show us that these things are not as important as you might think. In fact about it, even and we started out uh, last week in Matthew chapter 18 with the disciples arguing, who's the greatest in the kingdom of God? 
This seemed to be a thing. And, and, and if you look down to Mark chapter 9 too, let me read this real quick. <clears throat> Verse 33, and he came to Capernaum, and being in the house, he asked them, what was it that you disputed among yourselves by the way, that they held their peace, and they held their peace, for by the way they had disputed among themselves who should be the greatest. Now, Jesus knows they've been arguing. And he says, I, I, I kind of know Jesus knew what they were arguing about, but he asked them. And uh, he says, well, what, what was y'all arguing about? I could tell you he's arguing about something. And it says that they were arguing about who was the greatest. But watch, watch what he says uh, after that. And he sat down and called the 12 and he said to them, if uh, any man, or if, uh, if any, it said to them, if any man desire to be first, the same shall be last. In other words, he's saying he changes the definition for what great is. If you want to be great, if you're really interested in being great, then you know what the condition is? You've got to go low. If you want to be known as great, then you're going to have to go low. Because then that shows the real intention that God has to begin to show humility and to begin to look to Him. He says, but if you're trying to be great just so that people will recognize you as being great, you're in the wrong house. You're in the wrong place. This is not the right thing for you. And, and he's trying to show them that. So they're debating about what is the most important, the biggest things that I could do. Now, turn to Matthew 27. This is a place that I've kind of been building up to as we've been talking last week up to, the, uh, up to now. Matthew chapter 27. You say, well, why does all this matter? Because Jesus wants me and you to be a lot like him. I know people get hung up on that sometimes, but I'm like, look, you don't have two, you don't have two things you, you have a shot at. There's nowhere in between. You're either working to be more like Jesus or you're working more to be like the devil. It's just that simple. There, I mean, you, you, many times we think we're kind of somewhere neutral, somewhere in between. Let me just kind of hang here in the middle. There's no such thing. You're either working towards the things of God or you're working things towards the things that separate you from God. It's just that simple. And so <clears throat> he wants us to understand, yes, it's okay to aspire to be great as long as your intention is to do something good. But if you just want to be great for the sake of great, then folks, that's all about you. That's all about your pride. It's all about what you think that you'll be perceived as. And the quicker that you lose these kind of thoughts about what, what your expectations are in life as far as wanting to be known, wanting to do something great for the sake of being great, the quicker you lose that, the quicker you can truly find the real heart of, of what God wants for your life. Now look at this. Matthew chapter 27, verse 35. I love this. And they crucified him and parted his garments, casting lots that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet. They parted my garments among them, and upon my vesture they did cast lots. And sitting down, they watched him there and set, set over his head his accusation written, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then were they, two thieves, crucified with him, one on the right, one on, the other on the left. And they passed by and reviled him, wagging their heads and saying, You that destroyed the temple and built it in three days, save yourself if you be the Son of God and come down from the cross. Now I want to stop there just a minute. Notice they weren't talking about his goodness. Because to come down as you're nailed to a cross means it would require something great. It'd be something like raising the dead. It'd be like healing somebody that was sick. It'd be like walking on the water. It'd be like parting the Red Sea. It would be something great. In other words, for you to be nailed to a cross and then you, by your power of which, by the way, he had the ability to do. He had the ability to come down from the cross. He could have done it. And he could have said, 
Now do you believe? But here's the problem with that. The price for sin would not have been paid. He would have been revered as great. They would have looked at him and went, oh my gosh, did you see that? He just magically came undone from the cross. Oh my gosh. Oh, he must be the Christ. But the price would not have been paid. He would have done something great, but it wouldn't have achieved something good. This, if there ever is a truer picture, seeing that as he hangs on a cross and has the ability to come down and, 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 and show his greatness, if there was ever a time, ever a time, that there was an ultimate example of goodness being more important than his greatness, then this was it. He's more interested in doing what is good. Again, it took God's greatness to create the world, but it took his goodness to save the world. And he set aside the ability to do something great so that he could do something good. He said, great is not as important as good. It's not as important for me to show my power and the ability that I have to be able to do it. It's not as important as it is that I show you that I love you and to stay on the cross is good for you. And he was more interested in me and you than showing us how great that he was and how great that he is. He could have done that. He could have easily done that. He said, don't you understand that I can call for legions and legions of angels of which it would have only taken taken one to save him from being crucified. But he said, you you don't understand. I could do this and you all would just be lost. I could just go, you know what? Uh, We just wipe them out, God, and we just make some new ones. Right? He could have said, the human race is not worth saving Let's start over again. He could have done that. But you realize that as Jesus was hanging on the cross, you understand that Jesus wasn't just dealing with the people that had lived or was presently living that was in mind. He was actually thinking of the future as well, which includes me and you. He was actually thinking about me and you as well as the people at that moment and the ones that had died and was in a place of, you know, in between, couldn't go, the Old Testament saints that couldn't go to heaven, uh, but, but were bound in a place to where they, they, they couldn't get in because the sacrifice had not been paid. So he's thinking about them, he's thinking about the people that are present, and then he's thinking about me and you. He's like, they don't need to see my greatness as much as they need to see my goodness. That's why that we we put more emphasis on good than we do on great. Now, think about this just a minute. There are many other religions that believe different things, right? Now, I'm not, I'm not gonna act like I'm a, an expert on some of other religious beliefs, but uh, whether it be um, Jehovah Witnesses or whether it be Mormonism or whether it be Buddhism or Hinduism or Islam. Well, let's just take Islam, for example. People that follow Islam don't look for a good God. They look for a great God. What what do you, what are some of the people that have, you know, that have done, you know, things before, what's one of the last phrases that they lose, use as they are blowing people up sometimes? Is it Ali Akbar or something like that? God is great. In fact, in fact, isn't, Isn't the greatest thing that an Islamic follower can do, the greatest event in his life, would be to sacrifice his life to give his life? Isn't that what they they believe? That they believe if I give my life, then I get to go and be with the great God. But our God says, I don't want you to die for me, 
but I do want you to live for me. I don't want you to die for me. I don't expect, in fact about it, not only do I not, don't want you, I, do I not only not want you to die for me, I actually will die for you. Because I'm not interested in you knowing how great that I am as much as I am in you knowing how good that I am. That is the God that we serve. That is the God that tells us, this is what I want for you. I want you to know my goodness. I want you to have a revelation of my goodness so that you can understand and have a relationship with me because you can't have a relationship with greatness, but you can have a relationship with goodness. In Psalms 23, very familiar passage, Psalms 23, verse 6 says, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. He doesn't say, surely greatness and mercy will follow me. He, and now, who's he, what's he referencing? What's the writer of Psalms here referencing when he says, surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life? Who's that coming from? Obviously, he's, he's referencing God. He's saying, surely God's goodness and God's mercy will follow me all the days of my life. He doesn't say, surely God's greatness. He could have, but he didn't say that. He says in 1 Chronicles 16, verse 34, Oh, give thanks to Yahweh, for he is good, for his loving kindness endures forever. He could have said, uh, thanks, give thanks to Yahweh, for he is great, for his loving kindness endures forever. Great and loving kindness and mercy don't go together. But good and loving kindness and mercy complement each other very well. When it all comes down to it, you ask yourself this question. What would you rather be known as? Would you rather be known as a great man or a good man? Now today, I know what you're going to say. Because you know, you know the answer. What would you have said yesterday? What would you have said last week? I want to be a great man. I want to be known as a great this or a great that. I will take, I far prefer being known as a good man than a great man in any one particular thing. I'm not interested in somebody saying, uh, you know, Phil is just great at this. He's the great this. He's a great that. I would far rather, a real testimony of my life would be, he was a good man. Because that means that they are now identifying me with Jesus. Jesus was a great man, but only with the intent to bring goodness. He wasn't just interested in showing how great that he was, and what the things that he could do, and how anointed. He didn't walk around going, Check this out. Y'all think, I mean, you think that was awesome. Watch this. I'm so anointed. Look what I can do here. He didn't have that kind of conversation. Everything he did was an intention to help humanity. It's his whole heart. Amen. And the more that we can get like him, I know, look, I know you're never going to achieve to be the fullest place of, of where Jesus was and is. I, I, I get it. And, I, and I'm not either. But shouldn't we be striving to that? Shouldn't we be striving to get closer and closer to that each day? Why do you think that we come to church? Is it just so that you could say that you've been to church, you punch the box, and you can say the Lord say, hey, did you see I was there? I was there. Don't mark me off. Is that why you come to church? No, the reason you come to church, and this is one of the reasons why church is so important, is because you are reminded. You are reminded of things. Either you're getting revelation or you're getting reminded of the things that are important to you in your life and where you're at. It is a measuring stick, not to bring condemnation. It's never about that. It's never about trying to condemn you if you're not where you, you could or should be. But a barometer to show you at times, mm, I have let this slip in my life. I can make an adjustment so that I can come back. Yes, I've been too focused on great. I need to be focused on great only to the intent that it's going to do something good. That's the way. This is why we come. 
This is why that we hear messages. It's because God is speaking to us in these times. Do you know, I mean, I say this and I don't say this arrogantly, so don't misunderstand that. Whether it's me, Pastor Wells, Pastor Jason, uh, Brother Kenny, doesn't matter. Pastor David, whoever is speaking, when somebody's speaking to you, to, uh, to a, a group of people, you understand they're making every attempt that they possibly can to be able to hear from the Lord, to speak the right word at the right time. And as they're speaking the word of God, God is anointing that word so that it can do something to you. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and power who went about doing good and healing all those that were oppressed of the devil for God was with him. The reason that God was anointing him, Jesus, was so that he could do something good. When I come into a service, I want the anointing of God upon me so that I can do something good. So that I can say something good that will change the way that somebody sees life. They walk out going, oh. This is why, now me, I'm I'm just, you are who you are. People, so there's preachers and, 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 and are, you know, they, when I say preach, they just, they're, you know, they get after it. And and that's good. We need, we need that. We need times that we need to be motivated and we need to be encouraged and, and we need, you know, we need that. I'm not against that. I'm for that. I just am not like that. And it's not who I am. And if I try to do it, then I become disingenuous because watch, because now I'm trying to do something that somebody else is doing because I want. You do, you, you are who you are. And so for me, I know that primarily the gift that God gives me is to teach. I know that. I understand that. And the reason that I do what I do is because it lights my fire when I see that somebody gets a revelation or or when somebody gets something, a reminder, and they go, ah, oh, I I, I, I haven't been doing that. I I need to get back on track on that. To me, that's what turns my wheel. Listen to this, Romans chapter 12, we're almost done. Romans chapter 12, verse 21, he says, Be not overcome with evil, but overcome evil with what? Why not your greatness? Because it's not the character of God. It is the ability of God, but God's not interested in your relationship revolving around his ability. He's interested in your relationship revolving around his integrity, the character, the person that he is, and good is what reflects who he is. You know, the Bible tells us that God is love. He doesn't have love. He is love. He is exactly what love is. If you want to know what the definition of love is, you just go, well, God is love. So I see what God is, and that's what love is. And he... he, pretty well sums it up in the life of Jesus. For God so loved the world that what? That he gave his only begotten son, that whoever would believe would not perish but have everlasting life. It is who God is. Love is part of the gifts of the Spirit, of which also goodness is part of that. It is the character of God. It references and reflects who God is. And when you see these working in somebody's life, it's very evident to be able to pick out and say, that person is operating very well in the person that they should be. And it doesn't matter. Everybody has different personalities. You have a different personality than I've got. I tend to be, you know, one way, and and Debbie tends to be something different. She's reminded me lots of times through the years, I'd say, you know what I'd do if I was you? I'd do it like this, and I'd do it like this, because I think I got it all figured out, right? I mean, I'm, I'm doing it the right way. And she goes, she reminds me, I am not you, and I will handle it the way that I handle it. Amen. Now, your wife has probably never said that to you. You, you probably, you probably like have the best relationship in that sense that you just are like, you know, uh, you zig and she zags. And you zig and zag together just real nice and easy and smooth, right? Every now and then I have to be reminded, I am not you and I'll handle it the way that I handle it. 
be not overcome with evil, but overcome evil with, with good. He says simply that you can overcome evil by doing good. And you have to judge what that is because don't give me this stuff, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about this as we get into this a little bit more, but don't give me this stuff about, well, maybe there's a mystery to what good is. I've had people say that before. Does anybody really know what good is? Because after all, it could be this, and maybe we've misunderstood this. It's not that hard, folks. It's not that hard. You, you know the difference between good Right, look, look at this. You remember, and in, in, I believe it's in the, in, in the book of Luke. I think it's in Luke chapter 7 where, where Jesus was saying, um, look, how, you know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more will God give good gifts to his children? So he acknowledges you know how to give something good. You know what's good, Right? We've used this analogy before. You would not try to teach your kids, don't touch a hot stove by telling them, touch a hot stove so that you'll know not to touch the hot stove the next time. (laughs) Right? You know that's not good. Don't play in the road because after all, you could get hit by a car. But go out there and play in the road so that you can get hit by a car and you'll see it's not a good thing to do. How many of you would do that? You know better, right? You know what's good. And let me also say this. You know how else you know what's good? By the Holy Ghost that's in you. The Spirit of God speaks to you on the inside. You know when you're in the wrong. You know when you're in the wrong place. You know when you're doing something you shouldn't be doing. Because the Spirit of God begins to prick you. He won't condemn you, but He will convict you. And He begins to convict you and you go, "Ah, not I shouldn't be doing this. I I shouldn't be doing that. I shouldn't be going there. Whatever it be. The Holy Spirit talks to you. You You know what good is. Don't complicate it. Don't make it challenging. Don't make it difficult to try to, there's a big mystery in what is really good. It's not hard. You know what's good. Do what's good. And and if you do that, what does he say in Romans 12? If the if the scripture's true. What will, what will happen with you doing good? You'll overcome evil. With what? With good. I'll end today with Romans chapter 2. This is one of my favorite verses. Through the years, this verse has, has helped me to get an understanding of the character and the integrity of God. We've said it and went over it a number of times. I'm going to, in the next few weeks, you're going to hear it actually even more because I'm going to get it embedded inside you that you're going to know that this this verse is really the heart of who God is. He says, Do you despise the riches of His goodness and forbearance and long-suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God... Now, this is a question mark. In other words, he's kind of saying like, "Don't Don't you know? That the goodness of God leads you to repentance? Don't you understand that recognizing that he's good is what will lead you to repent? He's trying to tell us if you just get a revelation that he's good and that his heart is to get you to see how good he is. When Let me say it like this. Everybody pretty well knows that God's great. Go ask anybody. You remember the leper? We talked about it, I think, last week. He came down and he said, I know that you can make me whole, if you will. So, now, to make a leper whole, right, takes what? Takes great. Takes great. Greatness. He says, I know you're great by the fact that he said, I know you can. I know you're great. So everybody knows God's great. But not everybody knows that God's good. He said, I know you can. I know you're great. I just really don't know if you will. I don't know your heart. And that's to say I don't know your heart. That's an integrity thing. If you know somebody is capable of be, it would be devastating for me if my kids came to me and said, Daddy, 
I know you can help me in the, out of this mess, but will you? And I have the ability. And they're in a place, you know, to where devastation is upon them. But they question whether or not I'm interested in helping them. That would be painful for me to hear. That would mean, that would tell me this, that my relationship with my kids is not where it can be and should be. Because what after, after all, what do you want for your kids? You want to know that, you, that you, you're there for them. That's why you, that's, that's, I think parents forget sometimes. I don't mean forever in every situation. I know that some, they have to learn uh, to, to, to develop in their own life, and I understand all that. But look, when you, when you became a parent, you took on that responsibility to watch over those kids and, and to have a part of their life. Right, and and if I say no, I I I don't I don't know if I can do that. I don't know if I do it, Daddy. I'm sick, and I know you could heal me. If if they knew I could do that, and, and but question that I I would do that or not, that would be painful for me to hear. Amen. I imagine it's the same way with God. I know you can, but I'm not sure that you will. Everybody knows God is great. But not everybody knows that God is good. And again, greatness is an aspiration. It's not an assignment. But it can be used in a platform to do something good with. We're not against great. I'm not, I'm not against anybody being great in anything. Just know this, there's a reason for your greatness. Greatness. There's a reason if you're great at something, there's a reason for it. And you go, well, it doesn't have anything to do with the kingdom of God. I beg to differ with you. Everything has to do with the kingdom of God. Because it positions you to be able to speak or do or sow into somebody else's life. No matter what it is. It doesn't matter what it is. It, you, you, could be, it could, you could say, uh, well, they're a great actor. You know, and there's people that maybe come to your mind immediately if you said, who, who do you think is a great actor? You know, and you might go, oh, he is just such a great actor. She's such a great actor. You could be a great actor. There's nothing wrong with being a great actor as long as it's with the intent that you're going to use that platform to do something good with. There's lots of people that that are actors that are using their their gifts so that they can promote the kingdom of God. You just don't hear about them a lot. But there's lots of them. That's just one thing. There's everything, anything. The reason that we can be great is only with the intention to be good. God wants you to be great at being good. And if you can get that inside of you, then you'll see some things begin to happen in your life that you maybe didn't think was possible. I'm, over the next few weeks, I still have a lot to say about this, but I really wanted you to get the heart of what the message was in these two, in these two messages. The heart of it was that God is great, but everything He does that's great always comes back to something good. He's always working on your behalf. He's always trying to help you. He always wants to see you better than what you were before. Always. And that is, a, that is a symbolism of his goodness. He wants you to see his goodness. I, I, I don't question God's goodness, Pastor Wells. I don't. I just, I, I just, I know that even in the midst of problems and troubles and trials, I know this, there's a real devil on the loose. And I know what his mission is. Jesus summed it up in John 10, 10 when he said, the thief comes to steal, to, steal, to kill, and destroy. But he said, but, but wait just a minute. But I can help with that. I've come, and I hung on a cross, and I didn't display my greatness so that I could show you my goodness because if you get my goodness, you can overcome the evil with the good. That's wonderful. There's, the, the gospel is so simplistic. 
We complicate everything so much. We try to, well, does he really mean that? Does it really, is that really what he's trying to say? And all you end up doing is just confusing yourself even more. What if we was to just take God at his word? You know what good is. Strive to be a good man. Strive to be a good woman. And, you, and that, that references God and connects to God. If you try to do those things and let that be the way that you rule your life, you'll be so close to the life of Jesus. And I know this, I can say this with all total confidence. When you display your life with goodness, Jesus is very happy about this because it means that you're being more like him. The Apostle Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. In other words, he was saying, what you see me do is what I saw him do. And if you do what I did, then you'll be doing what he did. And you'll resemble him and people will be attracted to you. There's an attraction to goodness. That's why he said, it's the goodness of God that leads people to repent. It's not you scaring the hell out of them. Right? It's not that. It is not trying to scare people. It is not trying to manipulate people. It is just you displaying goodness and you representing God in a good, the, the, as the good God that he is. And you know what? That's what people want to be at, at, attracted to. That's what they want to be attached to. They see God and they see that he's good. When the world gets a revelation of how good God is, that's when they'll get saved. Seriously. When they get a revelation of God's goodness, that's when they'll get saved. Not you pounding on somebody, telling them they're going to hell. I, I know they need to hear, I know they need to know that. But that cannot be the motivation to them coming to the Lord. The motivation to them coming to the Lord has to go, man, I saw, I saw in your life you were going through some stuff. I saw you, you should have been defeated. You should have been destroyed. But you know what? You were like the Energizer Bunny. You just kept on going and going and going. And look what God has done for you. And if he did it for you, I bet he would do it for me. Yeah. And a lot of it has to do with the way that you represent him as well. If you're out there going, well, I just, you know, I've been serving God for 28 years and I just, I, I, I can't help it, but so-and-so is more blessed than me and I just don't understand it. Why are you concerned about what else anybody else has got? It's none of your business. Just stay focused on what your mission is and God will bless your mission. Just be a good soldier. Be a, be a good servant. And if you get the heart of a servant anyway, he already said, what happens if you want to be great? Then be a servant. And if you serve then you'll be great. That's what God is saying. At least that's the way he'll perceive you. He'll look and hit you. When he sees servants in the kingdom of God, God looks and goes, they're awesome. They're great. They've achieved a greatness because it wasn't what they wanted. Mm. I hope you can chew on that just a little bit. I hope that'll minister to you. If you would bow your heads for a moment, please.